dedicated to the strength of the nation. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring Dane Clark in A Christmas Story, The Stranger. The United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. And now here is our producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your Theater of Stars, where at this time we present Dane Clark in a special Christmas play, The Stranger. This is a heartwarming story of an American lieutenant who pauses in a small town for a Christmas dinner with an old couple. He finds the memories of two wars are revived and helps to discover an ending to a story that has remained incomplete for three decades. Lieutenant George Fondy receives and also gives his greatest Christmas present. Now we are ready for the curtain for Act One of The Stranger, starring Dane Clark as Lieutenant Fondy. The way it happened was almost a miracle. It was late afternoon, and the little park in the square seemed festive beneath its mantle of snow. In the winter hush, footsteps could be heard hurrying toward home, as they do in any town on Christmas Eve. The few people stirring had no time for a stranger. Only young Lieutenant George Fondy lingered, feeling as isolated as the trees, his heart almost as naked. Watching the softly falling snow, he felt at peace. And his mind was far away when... Merry Christmas, son. Merry Christmas. Huh? Oh. Merry Christmas, sir. I hope you don't mind our barging up to you. I'm George Colby. Mother here wanted to say Merry Christmas. Daisy, this is Lieutenant... Uh... Lieutenant George Fondy, sir. Glad to know you, ma'am, and a Merry Christmas to you. Thank you. George. Dear he, the Lieutenant... What is it, Mother? I just thought... Oh, this is a silly idea. And uh, your name is George, too. Yes, ma'am. You're a stranger in town, son, or have you folks here? Oh, I'm a stranger, sir, just passing through, you might say. Um, this is a nice little park you have here. The snow makes it so pretty, doesn't it? Father, I wonder if the lieutenant would like to come home with us for Christmas Eve dinner. Right. I'm sure Martha could manage. Say, that's a good idea. But perhaps Lieutenant Fondy has other plans for this evening. Well, I... Oh, I... now he can come all right. I just know he can. Good. <laughs> uh, wait here. I'll phone Martha and tell her to expect a guest, and we'll have a few extra trimmings, eh, son? Well, I... Why, you, you just have to spend Christmas Eve with us. We have a lot of c uh, things in common, a, a pair of Georges. <laughs> I won't be a minute. I hope we didn't rush you, Lieutenant. Father's so impetuous. Oh, it's all right, ma'am. I, I had nowhere to go. Oh. You know, uh... Mr. Colby certainly is a handsome man. He is a fine man. No one ever guesses him to be 70. 70? Really? Every day of it. Now, now don't look so closely at me, Lieutenant. I can almost see you counting up to 65 plus. Oh, no, ma'am. I, I, I was just thinking of someone else who was dainty like you. Only she was younger and her, her hair was very dark. It's all set. Martha's all excited. <laughs> It's been a long time since we celebrated. Oh. Martha's an excellent cook, Mrs. Colby. That was one of the best dinners I've ever eaten. Why, it's oh. a real pleasure to have you with us. Yeah, you've made it a gala evening, son. Oh, you're both very kind, and I've enjoyed being here. You know, this. There's something about a home that... I'm, I'm afraid that we haven't enjoyed ours very much in the past 26 years. Now, now, Mother, take it easy. I know how you feel, ma'am. Still, home is a... Home is a wonderful place. You know, that's how I felt when I met Daisy, Mrs. Colby, back in 1896. She was such a pretty little thing. Now, uh, The country was sweet with summertime and so... Hmm? 
I don't see why we can't get married right now. Oh, just a little longer, George, until we have $1,000 in the bank. Oh, Daisy, why? Well, I... I have a good job in the mill, and with last month's raise, we could get along fine. Well, uh, maybe we could get married early this fall. An Indian summer wedding. Mm -hmm. And we'll invite all the boys at the mill, huh? <laughs> you know, George, sometimes I feel like I'm marrying your beloved woolen mill. Oh, sweetheart. It isn't that bad, is it? <laughs> Daisy? Oh, How did everything George. go for my little wife today? Oh, all right, I guess. But I just know that I'm the world's worst cook. Look at that jelly. Huh? Oh, it does look a little thin, doesn't it? Oh, thin? It's watery. Oh, what do we care? Come here. Let oh. me tell you what happened at the mill today. Oh, now, now, George, you mustn't. I'm huh? all sticky. Oh. Uh, <laughs> what happened? Madam, you are now addressing the foreman of the mill. Foreman? Oh, George. Yes, sirree. And they told me if I keep up the good work, I'll be manager someday. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so proud of you. I knew you'd make it. And, George, huh? I have news for you, too. Not more jelly. Or did you conquer that cake recipe? Now, please, dearie, be serious. All right, I'm serious. Now, tell me the news. I'm bursting with curiosity. Well, George, we're... We're going to have a baby. Daisy. Honest, mm -hmm. are you sure? Well, of course I'm sure, silly. I saw the doctor today. He says everything is just fine. Oh, George, isn't it wonderful? Yeah, it's hard to believe. Imagine me, a father. Daisy, are you glad the baby is a boy? Oh, yes. Look how peacefully he sleeps. Isn't he beautiful? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I guess he is. Little George Jr. That's who he is. That's what I wanted you to say, Daisy. Mm -hmm. George Jr. Hey, look at the shape of his head. What's the matter? Anyone can tell that he'll be a great man. Might even be president someday. Oh, you're so silly. He probably will be just a normal little boy with a very proud father and mother. Daisy. Oh, Daisy, where are you? Here I am, dear. Goodness, what's all the excitement? Well, I went and did it. What? I bought an interest in the mill today. Oh, George, I'm so glad. You've wanted to for so long. Yep, it's quite an accomplishment. After all these tough years. Oh, but we've been so very happy together, we three. Yeah, it's been pretty swell. Just think, Daisy. Before we know it, George will be in college. Just one more year. A year sure rolled by. Hard to believe he's 17 already. Almost a man. I've been thinking. He's always said he'd like to go into the mill. Yes. Maybe we can give him an interest in the mill for a graduation present. Oh. Then he'll feel he is a part of it. Daisy. War has been declared on Germany. Oh, George, no. I'm afraid. What'll happen to our young George? Will he have to leave college? I don't think so. At least not for the present. Oh, surely there must be something. I must write to him right away. Now, Mother, don't get excited. But... The lad is 19. We must let him make his own decisions. Oh. I'll answer it, Mother. Hello? Yes? George! How are you, son? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes, I think so. Mother, it's George. He wants us to meet him in New York for the weekend. Homeward bound. It doesn't seem possible. Isn't he handsome? He's a good-looking lad. Everyone was so nice to us wherever we went. It wasn't us they were nice to, Mother. Your son's uniform did the trick. Oh, now, really, Father. <laughs> anyway. We had a perfectly wonderful time, didn't we? Yeah. You know, I've never been in so many nightclubs and, and churches. I know, sweetheart. 
Funny how you seem to need both at a time like this, isn't it? Yes. I, uh, I guess I'm, I'm getting awfully wicked, but huh? I really like champagne. Why, Mother, you amaze me. It was fun, though, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Somehow, I feel as though I'd tried to squeeze a whole lifetime into those three little days. I know, Mother. Now, stop worrying. Everyone says it's going to be a short war. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. And the boy will be back safe and sound before you know it. I'm going to hold that thought. Maybe then it, it won't seem so lonely without him. Good idea. You know what we'll do when he gets back? We'll go on a trip around the world. Just the three of us. The three of us? Like... Like last summer in Maine. Uh-huh. We had such a wonderful time. I'm glad we had that summer. So am I. Come on, Mother. Get your things together. Yes. We're getting pretty close to home. Oh, George, what a beautiful little tree. That's what I thought. I couldn't resist buying it. Let's trim it tonight. Even if it is two days before Christmas. Yes, let's. Here, stand it here in the bay window. George, look out there by the curb. Looks like that messenger boy is coming here. Stay here, Mother. I'll get it. A uh, telegram for George Colby, Sr. I'll take it. Okay. Sign here. Okay, thank you. Who is it from, Father? I don't know. It's from the... Uh, Mother, you... You better sit down. It... It couldn't be about George. Tell me. Read it to me. It says, George Colby, Jr., missing in action. Somewhere in France. We pause briefly from our story, The Stranger, starring Dane Clark, to bring you a brief message from our government. Once a year, the white of snow and the red of Santa Claus's old suit arouse memories that will not be denied. To us at home, it's easy to recapture those memories, even to relive them, of the days when we too were children and our stockings hung by the fireplace. But for the men of our armed forces stationed far from home, in places where the closest thing to snow is the white sand of the beaches, or where the closest thing to the red of Santa's suit is the blossom of the hibiscus flower, it isn't easy. But Christmas, with all its memories, is in their hearts, and they are thinking of you. Remember this. Remember them, and know that they send you a heartfelt Christmas greeting. <laughs> Curtain rises on Act Two of The Stranger, starring Dane Clark as Lieutenant George Fondy. It is Christmas Eve. In the big white house where Daisy and George Colby have known so much joy and so much sorrow, they are celebrating Christmas for the first time in 26 years. Their only guest is a stranger, Lieutenant George Fondy, a World War flyer who the Colbys met in the park that afternoon. Dinner is over, and Mr. Colby has just finished telling the young lieutenant about his son, George Jr., a flyer in the First World War. And of that day, many years before, when he read the words, George Colby Jr., missing in action. No, son. I've told you more about our boy than anyone I ever met. I don't know what got into me. We never talk about our George to anyone. I think I understand. I don't know why I've talked so much or even why we asked you here. Maybe it's because of this second war or because your name happens to be George. Or maybe it's because this is our first Christmas home after so long. Perhaps you're right, Mother. I don't know. I, you know, I guess I'd better be going. It's almost 11 o'clock. Oh, so oh. it is. But uh, before you go, son, how about some fine old brandy? Huh? Brandy? Well, that'd be, that'd be swell, sir. Thanks. We opened this bottle uh, 
Last Christmas, our boy was with us. He came up from school for the holidays. Here you are, Mother. Thank you. Done. Now a toast. A toast to... Yeah, yeah. Let, let, let's think a toast. Say, maybe I ought to tell you about my family. Oh, please do, Lieutenant. You, you know, I'm sort of a mixture. My dad was American and mother, God bless her, was French. But your name is French. Well, it is. You see, Fondy was my mother's name. You see, Dad had a week's leave soon after he got overseas in 1917. He met Mother in Paris the first night. Adrian Fondy was her name. Why, it's a beautiful name. She was a beautiful girl. Very young and lonely. You see, she was an orphan. However in the world did she manage? Well, she worked in a dressmaking shop. Oh? Mother was wonderful with a needle. Anyway, it was love at first sight. Mm -hmm. They were married the day after they met. In a church? Oh, sure, sure. Mother said it was a quaint little place on the outskirts of Paris. Oh, that's nice. It's always best to be married in a church. Yeah, I guess it is. Well, anyway, they spent the rest of the week honeymooning, enjoying the sidewalk cafes, picnicking in the parks, walking beneath the stars or in the rain. Go on, son. Well, they made a lot of plans. Naturally, they thought it was going to be a short war, and he would take his Adrian back to America when it was over. Oh, and so they came to America? No. No, Dad never came back. He was one of the missing who never turned up. And then Mother found out that I was coming, and she became panicky. Dad was gone, and she must not lose me. She was afraid of being an orphan again. Poor kid. Oh, dear. You see, she had a sort of a phobia. She was afraid that Dad's parents would take her child away from her, that she would be alone again. Oh, but they, they wouldn't have done that. No, I guess not. But you couldn't convince Mother. So she decided to have a go at it alone. That's why I was christened under her name. And then when the war was over, she brought me to America just as Dad had planned. She must have been a plucky girl. Oh, she was, sir, the best. But scared to death of losing me. You know, it was pathetic. But she couldn't help it anyway. She wanted to fight her battles alone. That's the spunky type who make good Americans. Oh, you should have seen her, sir. You should have seen her the day she became a citizen. Now, I was still in grade school, but she took the day off, and then we went to all the places in New York that we both left, sir. Oh. And afterwards, we celebrated in a little French restaurant, and Mother had a chair placed at the head of the table for Dad. Well, of course she would. But she must have been lonely with only a little boy. No, that's where you're wrong. She was completely happy. A few close friends and me and the memory of Dad. She needed nothing more except for me to be exactly like my father. Well, you're good, Georgie. Your papa lives. He was so fine. You must be like him. He must have been swell. The very best. Now you'll be good, huh? Study out in the school where Mama is at work, sure, yes? Sure, sure. And someday when I get a job, I'll get you everything you want. Everything? Sure, you're you? not going to have to work. I'll get you made. In this little flat? Of course not. We'll have a house, Mom. A big one. And uh, an automobile, a fur coat, and uh, diamonds. Yes? Diamonds? Yes, sir. I'll get you diamonds. Oh, Shelly, you're so good. Just like your papa. Mother, did you see today's paper? Yes, George. You mean this trouble in Europe? It looks bad. Yeah. Looks like it's getting worse, too. America will be in it before it's over. Just like the last time. You'll see, Shelley. That's what the fellows say. It's just a matter of time. Too bad, but it's true. Yeah. Well, it's about time for the news. This surprise attack on Pearl Harbor will go down in history as one of the... Oh. Now you listen to me, mon chéri. I've known all along how you would feel. You do not want to leave me, yet you want to help. Just as your papa did in 1917. No, Mother, I, I Please. won't... Please. It will be hard to part from you, but I cannot stand in your way. You have two countries, mon chéri. Go and fight for both. Thank you, Mother. I want to... I know. You want to fly like he did. Yes. Oh, 
Oh, you surprised me, Chérie. Oh. I got a short leave. I just flew in from England. Oh, ma Chérie, you look oh. so beautiful in that uniform. No, ma. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Look, darling, I brought you something. Oh, George. It's only a small box of dust. Shame on you, Mother. It's a soil of your beloved Paris. Chérie. Oh, my I'm not going to be here long. How about us having some fun before I go back? Anything you say, Sherry. All right, I'll show you how romantic New York can be. Almost as wonderful as Paris. Never. What will we do first? Central Park, in a hansom. Then dinner, then a theater, then the best nightclub in town. That's the last time I saw my mother. My first mission out after that leave, I got it. Very bad, son? No, just scratched up a little. Nothing serious. And then what? Prison camps for a year. Oh, how dreadful. Oh, could have been worse. Well, were you able to write to your mother? Sure, I wrote as often as I could. Oh, well, that's good. Oh, it's not so good. She didn't get my letters. She not did. one. After I escaped to England and was returned home, I found out. She oh, must poor. have worried a lot. Well, she was spared that. When I got home, she was... She was gone. Heart attack. Guess she thought I'd never come back to her like... like Dad. That was pretty tough going, son. Yep. Now I'm just a guy with no roots. No family. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's the matter? I shouldn't have told you about my mother and Dad. You... you both look kind of upset. No, it's not that, son. It's the bells. It... it, it must be midnight. It's... it's Christmas, Lieutenant. It's another Christmas without him. Oh, Mrs. Colby, come on now. You're going to make the old gentleman feel bad, too, if you don't perk up. Forgive me, Lieutenant. Sure, sure. But here, let, let, let me show you a real spunky gal. Yes, of course. One I used to spend Christmas with. I got these snaps wedged in my wallet so tight I can't get them out. Oh, oh here you are. Oh, Father, hand me my glasses, please. Yes. They're on the end table. I Thank you. Well, uh, who is it, Lieutenant? Mother, age 10. Oh, she's so sweet. <laughs> Darn pretty, too. And this one is Mother and me, just after I got my wing. Mm -hmm. ah, oh, she's she's even prettier in this one, son. Mm -hmm. I think so. And this one here is, is one of Mother and Dad, the last day they were together. It's a little faded, mm -hmm. see? Wait, I, I'll just take it over here under the lamp. I want... Father. What is it, Mother? What is it? Oh, what? come here. Oh. I've got her, sir. She fainted. Here, will you take this picture? I'll carry Mrs. Colby over to the divan. Now, if we had a glass of water, it might uh, help. Here, here, son. Here, try this brandy. All right. There you are. Mm -hmm. Here, she's... There, she's coming around now. Yeah. Here, yeah, thanks, son. Thanks. Oh, it's okay. Nothing to thank me for. I just happened to be here when she caved in. Son, wait. Mr. Colby, well, you look pretty white yourself. You're trembling. <laughs> Here, give me that snapshot of Mother and Dad. Take this brandy. Now I'm worried about both of you. No need to worry now. Everything's all right. But Mother and me, we... We want to say Merry Christmas. Grandson. the ages, Christmas has served to center our thoughts on home. Today, the men of your army and your air force, in Europe, in the Arctic, in the far-flung outposts of the Pacific, want you to know they are thinking of you. To you, fellow Americans, gathered around your paternal Yule log, they send their heartfelt Christmas greetings. Who among men can utter with more sincerity the age-old prayer for peace on earth goodwill toward men. Now, back at the microphone, our star, Dane Clark, and our producer. Dane, thanks for a fine performance. 
I understand you just returned from the Veterans Hospital Tour over the nation. C.P., when the Hollywood Coordinating Committee asked the Screen Actors Guild to make the tour into the 107 veterans' hospitals around the country, everyone who could jumped at the chance. Now that you're back, uh, what do you think? Well, I think it was the most exhilarating and the most heartwarming experience of my life. That's what I hear from the other stars who've been out. I'll tell you another thing, C.P. Yes? When the next hospital tours start, I'll be there with bells on, and I'll make it my personal business to enlist everyone I know to go. That's a fine and cheerful message to all the hospitalized veterans. And a fine Christmas thought, too, Dane. And, you know, this program is rebroadcast to our servicemen overseas. Well, that's exactly how I feel, C.P., but the one thing I'm not... There is one thing I'm not happy about. Yes? I couldn't be everywhere on this trip, so there's something left undone. What's that, Dane? Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> that makes everything complete, Dane, except for giving a preview of our story next week. Well, Dane and ladies and gentlemen, we'll start off the new year by starring one of the nation's most popular motion picture actors... Ban Johnson, and the title of our theater of stars play, To Keep This Oath. Here is a drama of the valor of the United States Army Medical Department, the untold and true story of a medico whose courage, bravery, and self-sacrifice is etched among those heroic pages of Army medical history. I know you'll enjoy this story, and Ben Johnson is the famed Dr. Northington. And now to our star, best wishes for a new year, Dane Clark. Those are my sentiments. And a happy new year to you, C.P. So long. Goodbye, Dane. And now, ladies and gentlemen, proudly we hail, joins me in wishing every one of you a happy and very merry Christmas and a new year packed with good health and prosperity. And these wishes come from all of us, our fine sponsor, the United States Army and the United States Air Force, the Gardner Advertising Agency, our proudly stars from Hollywood, our staff of engineers, writers, arrangers, musicians, and our announcer, Wendell Niles. So until next week, then, when we again meet at the loudspeaker, this is C.P. McGregor saying thanks for listening, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from Hollywood. <laughs> Dane Clark appeared through the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, which arranges for the appearance of all stars on this program. The script was by Tony and Bob McInnes, with music under the direction of Eddie Scrivanek. This program is transcribed in Hollywood for release at this time. Wendell Niles speaking.